You're listening to Breaking the Bottle Legacy with Molly Watts, episode 39. Hi, I'm Molly. After a lifetime living under the influence of family alcohol abuse, spending more than 30 years worrying about alcohol and my own drinking, believing I had an unbreakable daily drinking habit, I changed my relationship with alcohol forever. If you want to change your drinking habits, then Breaking the Bottle Legacy is for you. My goal is to help you create a peaceful relationship with alcohol, past, present, and future. Each week, I'll focus on real science and using your own brain to change your relationship with alcohol. Nothing has gone wrong. You're not broken. You're not sick. It's not your genes. And creating peace is possible. I'm here to help you do it. Let's start now. Hello and welcome or welcome back to Breaking the Bottle Legacy with me, your host, Molly Watts, coming to you from a pretty warm and sunny Oregon, I gotta say. I am enjoying it and soaking it up because from everything I've seen on the weather forecasts, it's not going to last. The rain's on its way. And while I know we need it, I never really look forward to it. (laughs) So today on the podcast, I am just super excited to share with you my conversation with someone who uh, admittedly is a different kind of idea and a different topic and a different expert than I typically talk to. I am speaking to Dr. Joe Bowler. Dr. Bowler is the Nomalini and Olivier Professor of Education at Stanford University. She also has former roles that included being the Marie Curie Professor of Mathematics Education in England. She was a mathematics teacher in London in several comprehensive schools, and she is the author of 18 books numerous articles, and is a White House presenter on women and girls. So uh, to say that I was thrilled to get to talk to Dr. Bowler would be an understatement. But what I really wanted to talk with her about is her latest book called Limitless Mind, Learn, Lead and Live Without Barriers. The reason I wanted to talk to her is because this book is really founded in neuroscience, and it's all about the neuroscience of learning. And basically, it's Dr. Buller's assertion that brain science has given us a very clear case for the importance of not only self-beliefs, but also the fact that we can learn anything at any time, and we are, in fact, limitless. So this is super important because whether you're trying to learn mathematics as a child or if you are trying to learn something new about alcohol or unlearn an established habit, right? It's all about believing that you can and the neuroscience that shows us that we actually can achieve anything if we believe in our limitless minds. So I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation. Here is my interview with Dr. Joe Bowler. Hi, Dr. Bowler. Thank you so much for joining me today and being willing to take time out of your very busy schedule to join me here on Breaking the Bottle Legacy. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Looking forward to chatting. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, before we get into talking about The Limitless Mind and the, the wonderful book, I want to know, I know because you're not, this is not your typical audience right here, <laughs> right? Can, no, is that, is that fair to say? That's right. I'm typically talking to teachers and students, but yeah. um, parents are a perfect audience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. And tell others, me, any adults, really. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about what you're currently working on right now before we get into Limitless Mind. Currently, um, I'm working to bring data science into K-12 mathematics. Uh, we know maths, as it's taught, is very antiquated and yeah. students are not learning the maths of the world. Yeah. And so that's really, like I said, a far departure from talking to adults who may be trying to change their relationship with alcohol. So uh, let's talk about, I want to share with with my audience how I learned about you and why I thought that talking about this book, The Limitless Mind, was something that would be so powerful for for us. 
So I actually learned about you from a friend who became a, who went back to school late and became a teacher. Well, she was working in an educational for, uh, environment, but actually went back and got her teaching certificate very late. And, you know, is a, is a, did her first year teaching during all of this COVID, which is just amazing. Mm. Right. Yeah, but really she, challenging. yeah, she became familiar with your work and she suggested your book to me. And then when I read it, I was blown away by how applicable it was and really how much it correlated with things that I talk about here on the podcast all the time. Great. And um, one of the reasons that I thought it was so important was because your you kind of talk about both. I mean, we talk about the fixed mindset, a growth mindset, but you talk about becoming unlocked and the ability to be limitless. Mm -hmm. And you talk about those, the keys that we're going to get to in the limitless, in the limitless mind. But do you believe that really that we're limitless, no matter what age we are, no matter what we're trying to overcome, are we all limitless? Absolutely. Uh, we all have limitless potential. Whenever scientists try and find limits and they go in and study people and give them harder and harder tasks, they come away always saying there are no limits. Really, people can learn anything. So if people are limited, it's not because of they don't have the potential to learn anything. It may be because of things in their environment or other people that are limiting them. But right. um, you have the potential to do anything. Right. So the premise of this book, and this is a direct quote from the introduction of The Limitless Mind, is when we learn the science in this book and the six keys of learning I will present, our brains function differently and we change as people. Mm. The six keys not only change people's beliefs about their reality, they change their reality. So that's a pretty big, powerful comment, right? <laughs> so, the, but it, for many adults, we have held on to kind of self-limiting beliefs about our yeah. ability to yeah. learn new things. Mm -hmm. It's kind of ingrained in our culture, right? Yeah. And, and what that quote is referring to is we know now what you believe about yourself actually changes the way your brain works. Yeah. So if you change your beliefs about what you can do, it will actually change how your brain operates and it will change your life. Um, so I really believe this is extremely important for everybody to know. Right doesn't matter whether we're talking about kids. I mean, really, honestly, it's not just about kids learning math. It's really about no. anyone who's trying to change anything in their, you know, to learn anything in their life or to Absolutely. Yeah. achieve something different. Um, mm -hmm. And I talk a lot about on the podcast about neuroscience and about neuroplasticity. And that's mm -hmm. again, why the book uh, resonated so much with me, because you're, it's very much a book that that incorporates the science of the brain, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. In fact, the six keys I set out uh, are all based in neuroscience. Um, what I do is take that neuroscientific information and figure out what it means for our lives and how it should change how we operate in our lives. Yeah. So you're, you're leading me right into key number one, right? So it's really because key number one is really about that neuroscience and yeah. about neuroplasticity. And it's that every time our brains, every time we learn our brains form, strengthen and connect neural pathways. Mm -hmm. And we need to replace the idea that learning ability is fixed with the recognition that we are all on a growth journey. So this whole idea of neuroplasticity. So neuroscience really, you know, we're still, obviously there's there's so much that we don't know about the brain still really, but this idea of neuroplasticity isn't necessarily new, but it is relatively new in the field of neuroscience, but it's also just hasn't really filtrated through to society as much as maybe scientists understand it. Yeah. It the hasn't. lay people don't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It hasn't. That's right. And um, neuroplasticity is really showing that our brains are constantly changing and growing and there's endless potential to learn. But if we look inside schools or we look inside workplaces, there are many limits that are put on people. Really going back to the old ideas that you have a certain kind of brain and that's the brain you live with. 
Um, so, yeah, I agree with you. The knowledge we have about our brains growing, changing, strengthening has really not got into schools or workplaces in the uh, to the extent that it should. Yeah. And I think that it's important because for I mean, it's important in many, many ways. What I found was that for me, learning the neuroscience, actually understanding the way that neuroplasticity works, realizing that my brain was capable of changing, helped form Mm -hmm. a foundation for me in self-belief, right? Once you understand that a little bit better, and when Mm -hmm. you really try to, when you really embrace it, you go, oh, okay, wait a Mm -hmm. minute. My brain Mm -hmm. can actually be rewired. It can literally be completely different than it has been. Mm. And I'm the person in control of doing that. If Norman Doidge, one of the neuroscientists I cite in the book, talks about how every single day you wake up, your brain is different from the brain you went to bed with. That's yeah. how much change is happening in the brain all of the time. I loved in the book, you and your British. So of course you shared some of this about the London taxi drivers Mm -hmm. and there, uh, I I thought it was, I mean, that the science and the study that was done on these taxi drivers, can you talk a little bit about that, about that study? Yes. So scientists, neuroscientists decided to study the brains of London black cab drivers because to become what's known as a black cab driver, um, you have to go through extensive training. It takes some drivers seven or more years. Which is crazy to, <laughs> to me. Yeah. I'm like, I mean, it's amazing. You have to remember uh, 20,000 streets in central London and all the connections between them. So it's a very hard training and test. They take a test that's just called the knowledge. And the knowledge, the average amount of times it takes to pass the knowledge, I think is 12 times. So so this got the attention of scientists. People are going through this intense right. spatial training. And so they decided to study the brains of black cab drivers before and after this training and found that their hippocampus had significantly grown, a really important part of the brain. And this was shocking at the time because some people believed that children's brains could grow or maybe some people thought that, you know, up until adolescence, but adults getting this significant brain change really changed the way people thought. And then they did further studies and found that when the black cab drivers retire, uh, some of that brain growth shrinks back down again, not because they're older, but because they've stopped using those pathways. Yeah. Yeah. So just more evidence of the flexible brain. And, yeah. And, you know, and, and a cautionary tale there folks, because there is, um, I've talked about this before with neuroplasticity, there is definitely a bit of a uh, use it or lose it. You know, you've got to keep challenging your brain mm-hmm, and keep absolutely. learning yourself to do new things, which actually yeah. kind of takes us to key number two. And this was, I, this is something that's dear to my heart and something that I really want to hit, hit on. Number two is that the times when we are struggling and making mistakes are the best time for brain growth. So with regard to mistakes, I use the phrase compassion and curiosity a lot. Mm -hmm. It's challenging for people to reframe mistakes in their life. And I think that's largely because of something you talk about in the book, um, the performance culture versus Mm -hmm. the mistake Mm -hmm. culture, where we celebrate mistakes as a way of learning. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's important to us to be aware of how we've been taught that kind of structure for mistakes in our lives. And and tell me more about what how what struggling really does for us Mm -hmm. as we're learning. Yes, the neuroscientists are very clear on this, that if you're not struggling, you're not learning. It's really the best brain workout you can have and making mistakes. They've actually done studies where they can see brain activity. And what they see is every time people make a mistake there's significant brain growth more than when they get questions correct. Mm -hmm. So we actually want people making mistakes and struggling. And I found over the years, as I've been sharing this information that many adults have come to me and said, um, this has changed the way I live my life. And what a relief it is to see that it's actually good for us to struggle and make mistakes. It made me, um, open up in meetings and say, you know, I don't know that, but I'd love to find out more and stop pretending to be an expert all the time 
Um, it makes kids more persistent when they learn. When I teach students, I always say, I want you to struggle. It's really important and um, best, the very best time for your brain. And it causes them to keep going when, when work is difficult. I mean, there are just so many implications for being accepting and understanding how great struggle and mistakes are for the brain. Right. It's, it's, it's so powerful. And for the conversations that I have with people and what we talk about, super important because with a, with a a habit where someone's doing something that's, you know, a negative self, a negative habit, right. So impact impacting health and, and just has negative consequences. Um, there can be a lot of self-reproach and a lot of, of shame that they associate with making mistakes. And so being able to really understand that it's, it's helping us learn. It's actually helping us move forward um, is so critical to, to enhancing that learning process. Um, All right. So key number three, when we, this is, and, and this is interesting as well. When we change our beliefs, our bodies and brains physically change as well. So this is really talking about self-belief and how, Mm -hmm. and how, when we believe in our ability to Mm -hmm. learn or don't believe whether we believe in our ability to learn or not, (laughs) it's actually kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and changes and and changes our, it changes us. Yeah. Yeah. The evidence that what you believe about yourself changes you is really extensive now, and it's been collected across all sorts of areas. So we could start by thinking about the impact of changing your beliefs on health. Mm-hmm. They've done studies that have yeah. found that um, you that people who believe that they are healthy uh-huh. um, are actually more healthy than those who don't believe, you know, or don't believe the exercise they're doing is healthy on multiple different measures. Um, and they've found that whether people believe they're, they're healthy actually predicts how long they live. Mm-hmm. So um, a huge impact on our actual bodies and our health. But in learning, those people who believe that they can learn anything, who believe that mistakes are good, um, actually experience more brain growth every time they make a mistake. So it's no wonder that that growth mindset and that belief in yourself actually predicts people's achievement and when they do interventions with people where they get them to shift from having a fixed mindset to a growth mindset suddenly their achievement spikes upwards so um, it's extremely important we also know that when people change their mindsets it um, decreases racism and aggression Mm -hmm. so just amazing implications of that mindset work and it's you know, it's one of the things I talk about a lot here is because a lot of people, when they're trying to change in uh, their relationship with alcohol, they're trying to change their drinking habits. They're focused a lot more on the action than they are on the thought behind it and the, mm-hmm. the, the feelings that are, that are happening. And right. so the mindset is so important mm-hmm. to us. It's important to us in general. I talk, I talk a lot about managing your mind, right? Because, mm-hmm. and that's really just, I mean, mindset, a different frame of mindset, but being able to, um, to understand how your brain works, being able to manage how your brain is, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. going after things and yeah. how you view it is really and I, and I think something that's really important is to work on banishing negative thoughts about yourself yeah and we all have them we all are very like you know some people more than others but we criticize ourselves we're self-critical we look in the mirror we don't like what we see and I I work on this myself of just not letting myself have those negative thoughts putting them away changing them being aware Mm -hmm. Um, Carol Dweck who is the mindset guru (laughs) talks about how it's really important to understand what triggers you, what pushes you into that self-critical thinking of thinking you can't do something. And it's really getting in touch with what triggers you and pushing those thoughts away that is so important. Yes, absolutely. 
another part to this whole keys to learning and being more mindful and being more um, aware of yourself is also becoming more creative and more flexible in your thinking. Mm -hmm. You talked in key number four, it's really that neural pathways and learning are optimized when you consider things from a multidimensional approach. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's really important to a, a discussion about changing people's drinking habits, because a lot of times we have, we get very black and white mm -hmm. about how we're going to do things, how, you know what I mean? It, it's you either do, or you don't, you either yeah. are, or you're not. And so having a more flexible and multidimensional approach to learning mm -hmm. in any scenario yeah, is, absolutely. is so important. Right. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's actually been proven. Well, I, yes. So one of the, some of the neuroscience is showing that when we think about things, our brains have multiple brain pathways operating and the very best, highest achieving people in the world have more connections between different brain areas. And that comes about when we think about things in different ways. So if I can just give an example for maths. Yes, uh, for of, a moment, course. of um, course, please. <laughs> uh, we think of maths problems as numbers. But if we think about a problem, let's say 18 times five, if we think about that visually, what would that look like? Um, how could you draw that out? You can also think about it with numbers. You can write about it in words. You could think of a story that involves 18 times mm -hmm. five. Um, you could build something to represent it. And all of these, these are multidimensional ways of interacting with that knowledge that will cause the brain to be having these great connections. So this really applies to everything in life, not just maths. Of course, you yeah. You can think about it and approach it in different ways. Um, maybe sit down and sketch it. I mean, that sounds crazy, but it will unlock different thoughts and different ideas. So we're not always thinking, I have to figure this out with my mind. and yeah. um, I, But actually engage in different ways with, problems in life and it will be great for your brain but it was it will also make those problems a lot easier to solve yeah and i don't think i mean i i totally understand what you're saying in, in using math in terms of a, an illustration spatially visually versus mm -hmm. just the numbers but it really does apply to just about anything and just like you said up to to like this thing, this type of learning. And when I'm talking about changing habits, mm -hmm. I, I encourage people to write things down, to write down their yeah, thoughts. So yeah. that's one, it's a different, uh, you know, it's a different dimension, right? When yeah. we're writing it's things down your head and write it down. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And then when you're, if you are taking in information, whether you're taking that information in via podcast, if you're listening to something, if you're reading something, mm -hmm. if you're having a conversation with someone mm -hmm. about something, mm -hmm. these are all different dimensions of learning yeah. the same different information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and really that's just going to enhance the brain's retention and growth on this subject. So right. it's absolutely all applicable, whether it's, you know, visualizing math problems or yeah. just really wrapping your head around different ways of Absolutely. attacking. Yeah, I actually shared a lot of these ideas in a book for maths teachers a few uh -huh. years ago called Mathematical Mindsets. And the biggest feedback I got from the teachers was, oh my gosh, you have to get this out to other people. Yeah, right. You have to get it out to parents and to other non-maths teachers and just everybody needs to know this which is what prompted me to write limitless mind to yeah. get the ideas out a lot more broadly no i absolutely agree and that's why it's been so such a great book for me i i shared with you in correspondence back and forth about setting up this this interview that you know i grew up um in talented and gifted right i was a mm -hmm. tag kid and uh i i've tease that I've been a lifelong know-it-all and mm -hmm. it's, but what's interesting about that is how limited I mm -hmm. realized my thinking was and how it did cause me to, you know, get in my own way with yeah. many of the yeah. things that I've tried to achieve or tried to do in my lifetime. And so this book has really opened up my thinking and saying, oh, okay, wait a minute. You know what? <laughs> this is, everybody has the capacity to be, and it's kind of a, you know, it made me really think about that because gosh, what a, what a, 
uh, commentary on mm -hmm. our education system that we mm -hmm. actually, I mean, what do we do with, I mean, these kids yeah. that are quick learners that are like, right. well, how do you, yeah. how do you differentiate and not, and it doesn't really seem right to call them talented and gifted and everybody mm -hmm. else is, you know, it's not yeah, right. you're talented. Yes, right. it's kind of horrible, actually. It is kind of horrible. And what we've learned over recent years is the damage it does to the kids who are put into those programs and given those labels, as well as the kids who get the opposite idea. Right. That I don't have gifts or talents because right. all of these are fixed messages and nobody should be having fixed ideas about themselves. Right. And we, we have a film on our website, which is called you. Our website is called you cubed. Yep. Dot org. And on the website, there's a film um, called rethinking giftedness, where I asked lots of Stanford students just to talk about being given that label. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting the way uh, they talk about how it caused me to not ask any questions. There was an expectation that I knew everything and the big problem is once you tell people they're gifted or even smart, if you praise yeah. them for those fixed labels, it feels good at the time. Right. But later, <laughs> when you mess up on something and everybody does, people start to think, oh, I'm not gifted. I am not smart. And they start to doubt themselves. So we don't want people thinking in those fixed ways. It turns out to have lots of issues. Oh, absolutely. And it's I I have come to see and be able to see things in my own thinking that were fueling my own drinking habits mm. because, because I never questioned, you know, when you're a, when you are a quote unquote, smart person, when you are a quote unquote, know it all, right. You don't question your own thinking, yeah. which is also a That's problem terrible. Yeah. yeah, because you exactly right. You really, because some of the thoughts that my brain was throwing out were completely wrong. Not good for you. No. Yeah. And they were fueling this habit, but I didn't hadn't didn't have the um the the framework to be able to mm -hmm. to do that. Now I do. And it's and mm -hmm. you know, so that's why I'm so passionate about sharing this work that's right. with other people. Yeah. So key number five, and I love this because um when I really was able to change my relationship with alcohol, it really was a two year process. Mm -hmm. And you know, I had a 30 year daily plus drinking habit. And I grew up as an adult child of an alcoholic. So I had a lot of past stories and a lot mm -hmm. of limiting beliefs. It mm -hmm. took me time. Mm -hmm. And for somebody who's smart and has always pride, you know, prided myself on getting things quickly, mm -hmm. realizing that, that this journey would take time and being able to stick to it and, mm -hmm. And really now realizing that that's how, how, how I became more of an expert in this mm -hmm. arena was because of the slow process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and practicing it over and over again. And I know in the book, you talk a lot about people that are, um, you know, you share some of the science and some of the other researchers who've done work on overachievers and what really is going on there. It isn't because they're super skilled. It's because they have just stuck with it. Yeah. Or they may be super skilled, but they yeah. worked at getting super skilled. Right, 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 right. They right. weren't just born like that. And yes, the fifth key is really all about communicating the importance of just slow, deep thinking um, and not speeding through things and not valuing people who are speedier. We all know that there are people who are quicker thinkers, but sometimes um, it's the slow, deep thinkers that have the really valuable thoughts. And Certainly our school system is not uh, built to value those slow, deep thinkers. Many mathematicians who we might think of as very high achieving people will talk about how they're very slow with maths. And one of them I like to quote, Lawrence Schwartz, talked about when he was in school, he felt stupid because he was one of the slowest thinkers in his class. He went on to win the Fields Medal, which is the biggest honor you can <laughs> in win. math, right? Yeah. Um, but many kids who are slow thinkers are really put off from learning um, by a lot of structures in place. So it's a very important message for learners that slow thinking is actually very valuable. What we what we want. When I teach my undergrads at Stanford, I say to them, when I give them hard maths problems, I'm not impressed by anyone who finishes this quickly. In fact, I am unimpressed by anybody who finishes <laughs> it quickly because 
that's telling me you're not thinking about it deeply and creatively. So um, it's true for all of us that, I mean, it's worse in schools. I don't think there are yeah. many places outside of schools that value and push kids, push people to do things under a time limit. Yeah. But um, it's a message for all of us in life, really, that the greatest learning and the greatest accomplishment will come from that slow pathway. Yeah. And the neuroscientists talk about this. They say that everybody can or, you know, some people can learn things quickly. But when we learn quickly, it's what they call easy go, easy come connections. Yeah. And all of the valuable learning is slow and deep and happens over time. So, yes, I do think this is important for us to take on in our lives, particularly when facing hard challenges like yeah. um, giving something up or trying to improve ourselves in some way that looking for quick outcomes is not helpful. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think you talked about in the book about the, you know, and I know everybody's had this experience where you cram for a test and then, you know, you can't remember any of it, right? So that's that kind of easy come, easy go. Yeah, right. And really it's that long, slower learning process that actually makes it all really stick. Mm -hmm. So key number six, uh, connecting with people and ideas enhances neural pathways and learning. I love this because I have, a, you know, I have an audience of listeners. I have a, a group of Facebook, a private group that where we share ideas and we talk mm -hmm. about this stuff and we take it to a little bit deeper level. Mm -hmm. And that collaboration is actually really important to yeah. learning. Absolutely. Yeah. Just connecting with other people when we connect with somebody else's idea, it actually enhances your own thinking. It's, it's harder to uh, connect with somebody else's idea than it is just to go with your own idea. Right. But it really helps develop your brain and also just so many important things that can happen in the world when we're connecting with other people. And in this modern world, there are all sorts of ways of making connections, some of which are online and that can be really meaningful and helpful experiences and collaborations that happen online. So it's not like, you know, it used to be yeah, that right. all of these connections have to be in person. Well, and, and I think some of the times the reason that people give up on, you know, following along with, with whether it's changing a habit, like drinking or whatever it is in their lives is because they think they're alone, right? They're, yeah. they think they're alone yeah. in their struggle. And so having, being able to realize that other people are struggling too, and that, yeah, and, and really reframing important. that struggle, mm -hmm. struggle together mm -hmm. yeah. is, this is one of the things they found in maths that, kids going through college traditionally just dropping out of maths in huge numbers when they put them into study groups they suddenly did well and one of the things they realized it was because in these study groups they all realized each other was struggling whereas when people worked alone they just thought oh I can't do this there's something wrong with me I'm going to drop out um, so it turns out that it's it gives you so many things and that's one of them recognizing that we all struggle in different ways but also just going it alone is really ever the best pathway right. through something difficult yeah and if you can make connections whether it's with one person or more people that's really going to um, help going through difficult times yeah going to accelerate the learning Okay. I know, like I said, I, I, I promised you a half hour, Dr. Bowler, and I want to stick to that. I could talk to you all day about all of the, this wonderful mindset stuff, the power of the limitless mind. Uh, but we've hit on all of the six keys and I would just encourage people. This is not, I, I, I absolutely do not believe this is a book solely about mathematics, though I learned a lot about the maths, about yeah. education and math, which I really appreciated as well. But this is really about uh, opening up the barriers to your own mind and your own mm -hmm. learning. And no matter how old you are, no matter how educated you are, uh, yeah. we can all become mm -hmm. unlocked and have more limitless minds. Very well said. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's really good to talk to you. Thank you for listening to Breaking the Bottle Legacy. This podcast is dedicated to helping you change your drinking habits and to create a peaceful relationship with alcohol. Take something that you learned in today's episode and apply it to your life this week. Transformation is possible. 
You have the power to change your relationship with alcohol now. For more information, please visit me at www.mollywatts.com.